Please subscribe, like and share our videos. Exclusive content brought to you here on Latif Yahya's channel only. Latif Yahya has asserted his rights under the Copyright, Designs, and Patents Act, 1988 to be identified as the author of this work. This book is sold subject to the condition that it shall not, by way of trade or otherwise, be left, resold, hired out, or otherwise circulated without the author's prior consent in any form of binding or cover other than that in which it is published and without a similar condition including this condition being imposed on the subsequent purchaser. Chapter 5 The President Munyam Hamd is excited. I've never seen him like this before. He's normally so detached, reticent, balanced and calm. An elegant, refined man who I much admire. Unfortunately, I don't think he has quite such a high opinion of me. I'm afraid he sees me as an object to be used and, if defective or troublesome in any way, immediately put out with the trash, like a disposable razor. And this feeling is getting stronger and stronger. It's the 23rd of October 1987 just gone 8 a.m. and it's already hot in Baghdad. So far so good, says Munyam Hamd. I know what he means. Yesterday the palace replied to the letter. The president wants to see me for himself. A personal meeting with Saddam Hussein. I feel proud though I've no reason to be. I should be worried sick. If his lordship doesn't accept me, I'll probably suffer a fate worse than death. A fate from which death will come as a merciful relief. It's even possible that Munyam Ham's own fate hangs on this as well. Surprisingly, I don't feel nervous or frightened as I did when I was summoned from the front line. Now I know what's going on and I can help myself get through it if I play my part well. I'm determined too. I'm good. I know it, Uday knows it. I just have to convince his father who knows him better than anyone. Our meeting is at 4 p.m. this afternoon so prepare yourself, Munyam Ham says in a peremptory tone of voice I haven't heard him use before. I've long since got used to my new teeth and my training has been so thorough and intensive that I don't just imitate Uday's speech defect, I do it instinctively, automatically, without hesitation or thinking about it. You mustn't concentrate on it? I've been told a thousand times, it must flow from your mouth. And now it does. Plus I have mastered Uday's movements, postures and gestures. I hold and smoke a cigar exactly like he does. I have his grin, his wink and his hysterical, high-pitched, hyena laugh. It's all second nature to me now. Saddam sends one of his own cars to collect me and a posse of his officers including Abed Hamid al-Tikrit, Arshad Yassin and Fener al-Tikriti. Saddam is constantly surrounded with a horde of personal confidants, all of whom I'm destined to meet. Colonel Arshad Yassin is Saddam's brother-in-law, married to Saddam's half-sister. He is personally responsible for the safety of Saddam Hussein and has a whole staff of guards under his command. Colonel Abed Hamid al-Tikriti is one of the president's closest friends and bodyguard. Major Rokhan al-Tikriti has served alongside Saddam for decades. He's responsible for training all the bodyguards and sentries in the presidential palace. Saddam Kamal is Hussein Kamal's brother and another of Saddam's bodyguards. Captain Jamal Saddam is Saddam's second escort. He also works at the information office in the conference palace. Lieutenant Adi Omar, bodyguard. Lieutenant Mohammed Fadel. Soon to be imprisoned for. Murdering two dancers who refused to have sex with him at one of Saddam's private parties. Lieutenant Raif Dalabed, a bodyguard and nephew of Colonel Abed Hamid al tikriti Lieutenant Hakim Kamal, a bodyguard and youngest brother of Hussein Kamal. Second Lieutenant Nazim Ahmad al tikriti bodyguard. Lieutenant Mohammed Kamal Dori, bodyguard. Lieutenant Saadi Nai al tikriti bodyguard. Lieutenant Raif al tikriti bodyguard. Lieutenant Riyad Mohammed al tikriti bodyguard. All these men form the president's closest, inner circle. They come and collect me at 3 p.m. to the millisecond. We all hurry through the hallway into the open and sprint to the Mercedes. The door is already held open for me. 
I jump into the back seat and the convoy moves off with doors still open. There are two cars in front of my car and two follow behind. We travel the short distance from project number 7 to the family gate, near the main palace entrance, at more than 60 miles per hour. As we approach the entrance, we slow down a little. The armed sentries lower their weapons and wave us through. We pass the hospital and all the ministerial apartments and 20 minutes later pull up outside the information building which forms the east wing of Saddam's palace. Before it's even fully stopped, my bodyguards leap from the Mercedes, secure the car and, only when they are all in position around it, do I get out. Everything has to look right, a carbon copy of what I'd been taught in all those hours of training. I jump out the car, Saddam's men cluster round me and we all run towards the wide, inviting steps leading up into the information building. Four officers are waiting for me, one is Rokan. We hurry into the foyer where Rokan darts into a side room. For ten minutes, the rest of us stand in the foyer and wait tensely. No one speaks or smokes. Then a high-ranking officer approaches. He's an athletic-looking man with wide shoulders, a bullish neck and massive hands. His green uniform stretches tight across his chest. All his physical features seem too big, too weighty, he's a human powerhouse. Though we've never met, the officer seems to know me. So you're Latif. Do you know the rules? I know them. I know all about Saddam's phobia concerning poison. It's an obsession with him, a bizarre fascination. During my training, I'd been told the story of the Minister of the Interior, Ezzet Ibrahim. Ibrahim was a man to whom nothing was sacred. In his time, he'd used just about everything that could be used to kill. Like me, he was summoned to see the President. Before Saddam received him, Ibrahim was stripped naked, thrown into a swimming pool and then his body was rubbed all over with dental. Apparently, Saddam had suspected Ibrahim of carrying mysterious microbes or a deadly poison that can be passed on by a friendly handshake greeting. Since then everyone, myself included, has to undergo a thorough physical examination before being permitted to have an audience with the president. The officer begins by giving me a close physical examination. He searches everywhere starting with my pockets and the folds in my uniform jacket. Then he reaches under my armpits, runs his hands over my bottom, prods my crotch, and pats down my legs. Then he orders me to take off my shoes and socks. Another quirk of Saddam's is he hates his subordinates meeting him in socks that have been worn, even if they're wearing shoes. He simply can't bear unclean socks. So the officer issues me with a pair of brand new socks. White cotton ones, size 9. As I put the new socks on, the officer calls the doctor. Like the other doctors who examined me a few weeks ago, this one isn't an Arab either. He has ginger hair, his sharp featured, pale face is covered with freckles and his eyes are unusually close together. He looks furtive and sly. Without saying a word, he puts his brown leather medical case on the table, opens it and begins to examine me. I submit in silence but think it's all ludicrously paranoid. There's no way I could have any weapon hidden about my person. In any case, I've been constantly watched for weeks. I've been a prisoner living in virtual solitary confinement and Uday's doctors have examined me numerous times. Maybe Saddam doesn't trust his own son? That thought amuses me. The doctor pulls on surgical gloves and runs his hands over my skin. Then dips cotton wool swabs in a tincture and wipes them over my face, ears, neck, arms and hands. After each wipe, the used piece of cotton wool is dropped into a glass jar containing a blue solution. The doctor regularly examines this as if checking whether it's reacting with what's on the cotton wool but it doesn't change color or react in any way which I assume it would have done if I had some kind of poison on my body. Next, he inspects my eyes. He pulls the eyelids down and checks my mucous membranes. Tears well up in my eyes but that seems to be normal as the doctor ignores it. The officer orders me to open my mouth as wide as I can. The doctor swabs my tongue. Illuminates along my jaws with a little chrome lamp, examines my teeth and finally runs his little finger along my gums both inside and outside my mouth. It's a ridiculous ceremony, a ritual, a paranoid schizophrenic spectacle. 
I'm not convinced the examination really achieved anything or stopped anything from happening. A martial arts expert can kill a man with a single blow or kick to the head so all these precautions are quite pointless. Finally, the doctor hands me a small plastic bottle of dental and tells me to rub it into my hands. I spray some of the solution onto them and rub my hands until they're dry. The doctor seems satisfied and packs his things into his bag. The only words he says to me are, Latif, remember not to kiss Saddam. So now I'm cleared and ready for the big moment. I've been cleansed and prepared like a Muslim pilgrim on the Holy Hajj in Mecca, before he kisses the Kaaba. But there's a crucial difference, the Hajj is the highest fulfillment, the absolute duty of a Muslim. Every Muslim must visit Mecca at least once, the Quran decrees. My visit to see Saddam might also be a once-in-a-lifetime experience. But if he rejects me, I could be killed there and then. I'd rather be visiting Mecca. Surprisingly, I'm calm, almost relaxed. I'm even looking forward to meeting my county's president. Saddam is not just our head of state, he's Iraq's prophet, the incarnation of power, the one who decides what's good and what's evil. Millions of Iraqis would give everything for this moment. Many would even give themselves. But I'm no more nervous than I would be if I was driving with my father in his white Volvo to go fishing in the Tigris. I'm not afraid to die. The door opens. The officer steps forward and orders me to follow him. After a few steps, I'm standing in the hub of absolute power in Iraq, President Saddam Hussein's office. The room looks like a copy of Uday's study and project number 7 though I'm sure it's the other way round and Uday has designed his office on the model of his father's. The very same pastel wallpaper, the pale yellow couch, the weighty English desk and shelves lined with volumes of Arabic literature. Saddam is sitting behind his desk, talking on the telephone and deliberately ignoring me. Another similarity to Uday. Uday never immediately greets anyone. He shows his power over them by making them wait. Uday has clearly learned his social etiquette from his father. Saddam is fashionably and smartly dressed a dark, double-breasted suit and a brightly colored floral tie without a tie pin. He holds the receiver, Siemens brand, I notice, in his left hand, his right lies on the desk. He's rhythmically tapping his middle finger on the desk. He chuckles at brief intervals and I'm grateful he seems to be in a good mood. His voice sounds soft and warm, almost tearful. There's no strength or violence to the tone and it doesn't sound like the voice of a world leader. He speaks fluently, without punctuation, without peaks in volume and without any emphasis on particular words. I gather Saddam is discussing a speech he's about to deliver with an advisor. On the back of his right hand, I can see the faint remains of a tattoo he had years ago. At first, I think the mark is a patch of pigment you sometimes see on the skin of older people but no, the mark is definitely the trace of a tattoo that's been badly removed. His fingernails are carefully manicured and lacquered. His hair is jet black and immaculately cut, not a hair out of place, as is his mustache. When he laughs, I see he has perfectly straight and gleaming white teeth. I wish Uday had inherited such a set. Instead, he'd inherited Saddam's eyes which are also brown and expressive. The only signs that suggest this man is over 50 are bags that are beginning to form under his eyes which you have to look carefully to notice. He also has a few wrinkles between his nose and mouth. He looks like a combination of the young Jean Gombin and Sultan Saladin. My initial impression of Saddam is he's a handsome, tall, slim, well-presented, imposing man with a ready smile. He puts down the receiver, springs to his feet, walks out from behind his desk and, when he sees me stood there, bursts out laughing. It's a deep, throaty laugh. His laugh isn't fake, he's genuinely amused at what he sees. He takes a couple of steps towards me and begins making insignificant small talk. He asks about my time at the front, my parents and brothers and sisters. He doesn't give me time to reply but supplies the answers himself. I always nod in agreement. Saddam looks me up and down, studies my hands, my teeth, my eyes. I put on a little show of facial expressions and hand gestures for his benefit. He says nothing but I think I know what he's thinking. He really does look very like my son. Even so, 
he takes me completely by surprise when he suddenly spreads his arms and announces, yes, it's you. Allah gave me two sons but now I have three. I'm relieved but confused. The whole security ceremonial before, the examinations, the clear suspicion, the physical and psychological pressure exerted on me, this alternation of threats and gratitude for what I've achieved to date seems to have dissipated. I'm still alive and have survived the most important test to date. Saddam's statement both pleases and worries me in equal measure. He has accepted me as a fide, the body double of his eldest son. So now I'm a member of his clan. I'm part of it but I still don't accept it in my head. I already have a family that I love and think about all the time. Saddam's clan don't love me and never will. They tolerate me because I might take a bullet meant for Uday. I'm no longer anything but a useful object that one day will be either broken or thrown away when no longer needed. Uday's toy teddy bear that, if we both survive, he'll then destroy rather than allow it to be produced and embarrass him that he ever played with it and needed it to comfort him. But, more than my self-doubt, I'm touched by my initial impression of Saddam Hussein. I had imagined him to be quite different from the friendly, cultivated man with a pleasant nature I'd just met. I'd assumed he'd be louder, colder, more arrogant, more brutal and downright cruel. He must be different from how he appears. After all, he's sent hundreds of thousands of Iraqis to their deaths both at the front and in his prisons. That would trouble anyone's conscience. But does Saddam have a conscience? Probably not. Presumably cruelty becomes acceptable if it occurs in the public interest. Killing one person is murder. Killing thousands is an act of state. That must be how Saddam excuses his crimes. Nothing about the president seems cruel, cold or evil. He's very charismatic and has a captivating personality. So this is the man who has the whole country by the throat in an iron grip? The man who can transform the population into a fanatical, euphoric mob which unconditionally sacrifices itself for him. No western pop idol or movie star inspires such fanatical adoration. Saddam Hussein has emerged from a culture in which western values were just as alien and extreme as Islamic values still are to the west. He was born on the 28th of April 1937. His parents were peasant farmers. The only noteworthy fact about his birthplace is that the legendary Sultan Saladin was also born there. It's al near to Crete, a little provincial village 80 miles to the north of Baghdad. His parents named him Saddam which means the steadfast one because his mother failed to lose him. Suba Tulfa had conceived Saddam out of wedlock. During her pregnancy, she tried to abort her unwanted baby by exhausting herself with extremely hard physical labor. Saddam's father died before his son was born. Suba Tulfa married Ibrahim al-Hassan who refused to have anything to do with another man's illegitimate child so Saddam was given to his uncle, Karola Tulfa, to look after. Raising his nephew wasn't Karala Tulfa's priority in life as he was an officer in an Iraqi army unit that took part in an attempted coup against the Hashemite King Faisal II. It was unsuccessful and Saddam's uncle was imprisoned for several years. From 1936 to 1941, there were six attempted uprisings in Iraq so young Saddam grew up in a revolutionary period. It was also a harsh and violent period in Iraq's history. When the head of Saddam's family was released from jail, his uncle's clan found they could only make ends meet by resorting to street robbery and frauds involving the water supply. The village where Saddam grew up knew about his illegitimacy and, like his stepfather, rejected him. But Saddam proved to be as tough as old boots. School wasn't for him and he rarely attended. When he did and when he didn't, the headmistress in Tikrit despaired of him but he excelled at one subject not on the school curriculum. At the not-so-tender age of 10 in Saddam's case, he was already showing signs of the violence that was to propel him to the top of a totalitarian system and prove far more useful than academic skills. He was never parted from an iron truncheon which he used to keep his schoolmates and stray dogs at a respectable distance. When at school, he hid it under his jalaba. He sometimes heated it in a fire until it was red-hot and, surrounded by shocked but fascinated classmates, would torture the feral cats or dogs he'd captured with it. The truncheon was his fetish, his father, his power, 
his only friend and his protection in the face of an uncaring society that had unfairly rejected him simply because his father was dead and his mother had married someone else and moved away. Hardly Saddam's fault. But it had caused a rift. Saddam grew up hating society because society hated him. And the only thing that he could cling to and get support from was his iron truncheon which he used to torture to death the only things he felt superior to, animals. In 1955, an important change happened. His uncle moved to the Tekarte district of Baghdad and Saddam was sent to the El Kark school. At that time, many members of the Tikrit clan were street robbers and ruled over the people of Baghdad in a similar way to the Mafia in Sicily. Business boomed and the Tikrit clan acquired more and more power and influence. It was a strict regime and family feuds had bloody outcomes. One such family disagreement was the motive for Saddam to commit his first murder. He was just 19 but, on his uncle's orders, he shot a rival street bandit. The victim was another distant uncle of Saddam's called Saadi. The murder showed how close Saddam was to the Tikriti clan and marked Saddam's first big step towards earning a living through killing. Despite violent distractions and being a late starter, Saddam became determined to get an education and graduated from his grammar school. Whilst studying, he formed strong political opinions which matched the nationalist, revolutionary goals of the Iraqi Ba'ath Party, the Party of Arab Renewal. At the time, its policies were so extreme that it had to operate covertly. In 1957, Saddam joined the banned Ba'ath Party and also automatically became an active opponent of the Iraqi dictator, General Qasim. Two years later, on 17 October 1959, Saddam was chosen to take part on an attempt on General Qasim's life. The Ba'ath Party had adopted European ideologies such as nationalism and socialism and its members weren't the kind of men to wait patiently for change. They wanted to achieve reform instantly through violence in accordance with the long-standing tradition of the region. General Qasim was aware of the unrest and issued vague promises of reform but he was not a Tikriti. This fact alone made him an enemy who needed to be eliminated. The Ba'ath Party was rapidly gaining wide support amongst Iraqis who were brutally suppressed and exploited by General Qasim and so the time was judged to be right for a coup. The attempt was a complete failure and Saddam was shot in his leg. He cut the bullet out himself and managed to flee to Syria. He stayed there for six months and met the lawyer, Michelle Aflac, who was the founder of the Ba'ath Party and became Saddam's political mentor. In 1962, Saddam moved to Egypt where, Surprisingly for an assassin, he began to study law. At the same time, he became an important member of the Ba'ath Party in Cairo. Although he played a relatively minor role in the botched attempt on General Qasim's life, Saddam's participation was sufficient to spawn heroic myths in his later years. However, his audacity and courage was an indisputable fact. Saddam was probably disappointed that, while he was studying in Cairo, another coup took place in Iraq led by Hassan al-Bekr al-Tikriti. This time General Qasim was toppled and publicly executed. Saddam hurried back home and asked his uncle for permission to marry his cousin Sajida. The marriage had been arranged when they were both very young which was in accordance of the rules of the al-Tikriti clan. If possible, you never marry outside of your own extended family. But things didn't work out quite as the young couple hoped. After just a few months, Hassan al-Bekr was deposed by Marshal Aref and his officers who were bitterly opposed to everything the Ba'ath Party stood for. As an important member of the party leadership, Saddam found himself in jail once again. Though locked up and unable to attend, he was still elected deputy party leader at the 8th Ba'ath National Congress. Shortly afterwards, Saddam somehow managed to escape. After years of unrest that was virtually a civil war, in 1968, Ba'ath supporters wrestled power back again from Marshal Aref. Hassan al-Bekr took over as head of state and none other than Saddam Hussein al-Tikriti became the second most powerful man in Iraq. Saddam took over leadership of the investigation committee based in the notorious Qasr Nayaja prison. Qasr Nayaja means palace of no return and it lived up to its name as Saddam quickly identified hundreds of political opponents who were tortured and killed to ensure they caused no future problems. Saddam also put on a show of strength to fanatical supporters in Baghdad's Republic Square by having over a hundred men hanged. Their crime was they were agents of Israel and the USA. 
Saddam proved to be a ruthlessly efficient deputy general secretary as well as being a capable planner and organizer. In 1972, he nationalized the Western-run oil industry and signed a friendship treaty with the communist USSR. The agreement led to the Soviets arming Iraq. President Al Becker had opposed this treaty and had only changed his mind when Saddam had pulled a gun on him and shot him in the forearm. Saddam had the gall to do this in the president's own office. The friendship treaty with the USSR still didn't stop Saddam killing huge numbers of communists. Nor was he exclusively anti-communist. He was open-minded enough to have anyone of any political belief executed if they were considered a future possible opponent. President Al Becker's influence quickly declined and he became a mere symbolic figurehead. On 16 May 1979, he died of a heart attack. At least, that's the official version. In reality, he was poisoned on Saddam's orders. Maybe that's why Saddam is so wary of being poisoned himself? Saddam Hussein was only 42 when he seized the reins of power to become the most important man in Iraq and one of the most influential in the world. He wasted no time in making the most of his new position. Many high-ranking officials were executed including the mayor of Baghdad. The new president introduced the death penalty for criticism of himself and began developing a personality cult similar to that of Nicolae Ceausescu in Romania. Like Ceausescu, Saddam appointed his relations to the most influential government and military posts. The whole al tikriti clan suddenly came to power. They turned Iraq into their own private business and club, as their clan decrees. Just as Arabia became Saudi Arabia, Iraq became al tikriti Iraq, although less visibly. Officially, Iraq was ruled by a 15-man revolutionary commandership with Saddam Hussein as its leader. Unofficially, there was a special council which was like an al tikriti family gathering which controlled every aspect of the whole country. And there's one other comparison between the Ceausescu and Hussein regimes, both leaders had sons who turned out to be liabilities. Niku Ceausescu, who Uday knows personally, has made headlines with wild drinking binges and rapes, on one occasion, it said he was drink driving and knocked over and killed two pedestrians. The Romanian Secret Service hushed up the incident just as the Iraqi Secret Service does the same to Uday's extravagances and crimes. And now I, Latif Yahya, am in the thick of it. Not as a full member of the clan but as a fide I am still in the heart of power and privy to details of the regime which are hidden from millions of others. I am going to live my life as they do. I am Uday and the third son of Saddam Hussein so the president himself has just told me. The thought makes me feel nervous but I don't show it. Saddam says, all that I require from you is you do your work well. Yes, sir, I say and Saddam continues, if you do, I will be pleased with you. If you do fulfill your duties 100%, I will always be there for you, for all your problems. As he pauses briefly and breathes through his nose, I wonder what he means by this. His next words provide my answer, dot 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 and for any problems you might have with Uday. Just make sure I have no reason to be angry with you. I wait a few seconds in case he's going to elaborate further but when I realize he isn't, I reply, I hope I will do everything correctly and well, sir. Saddam Hussein doesn't react. He doesn't shake my hand. He just turns his back on me and returns to his desk. He picks up his phone and presses a red button on it. Almost immediately, the officers return and escort me out. Back in the foyer, they enthusiastically gather round me and clap me on the back like I'm a footballer who's just scored a goal. One asks me how I feel. I just nod and say casually, I'm okay. Follow for the next chapter.